What I'd like to talk to you about here is not the what or the how or the where, but the why. It's the question I get asked all the time. Why would you do something as seemingly ridiculous as try to walk the length of the world's longest river? Um, and to do that, I'm going to have to take you on a, a very brief 15 and a half minute journey um, back in time, all the way back to the birth of civilization. But I'm going to start just two years ago in Paris. Um, <laughs> It's going to be a challenge, but I'll try. So if anyone's been to Paris, I'd highly recommend the La Palette restaurant. Great wine, great atmosphere. Um, I was there with a very good friend of mine, um, the great travel writer Ash Bardwaj. And he was there to try to explore the reason why Paris became a creative hub in the early 20th century. Has anyone seen Midnight in Paris? Okay, all, you know, all the famous names, Hemingway, Dali, all these people, great writers, um, painters, and philosophers, all converged on Paris, and we were trying to um, understand why. And as we got steadily intoxicated on rosé wine, um, we kind of came, came up with some theories, and Ash came up with a theory that, looking around, all of these chairs, all of these stools were very close together, and all the people there were, were sort of clumped up, and, uh, and we saw it, you know, I was sitting there in a sort of straight row, you can see on the picture there, um, you'd have somebody sort of leaning over and talking to the guy next to you, and um, in England we don't really do that, it's all sort of very, you know, we, li we like our personal space, but in Paris it's the norm, and uh, we came up with the idea that actually, perhaps that was one of the reasons, you've got perfect strangers who didn't really necessarily know each other, and bear in mind in the 1920s and 30s, you wouldn't necessarily be able to put a name to a face. There was no Google. Um, but people just got along. People were forced to speak to people. It doesn't really happen these days. People were forced to share ideas, and communities were formed. So I decided to take this idea and apply it to the birth of civilization. Can anyone see what that picture is? Any ideas? It's, yeah, it's an elephant, if you can sort of see it. What's remarkable about this elephant um, is one, the fact that it's um, about six and a half thousand years old, and two, um, its location. It's actually, this is a boulder in the middle of the Sahara Desert in Sudan, and I, I stumbled across this boulder um, about three quarters of the way through my journey. And the reason I'm showing you this um, is because anyone who's been to the Sahara Desert knows there's no elephants there. Um, but there used to be. 5,000 years ago, the Sahara Desert wasn't a desert at all. It was, in fact, a huge, lush, wet, green savanna, much like places like Uganda and Kenya and the rest of Africa. Um, and along with elephants and buffalo and all these other animals, there was plenty of cavemen as well, running around, catching their prey in sort of a blissful ignorance um, of the rest of the tribes and the other people. And um, what happened was, about 5,000 years ago, the desert sort of got bigger and bigger and bigger, and it's still getting bigger, bigger today. And it forced all of the wildlife away out of, the, um, out of the desert, and it also forced the people who were chasing after them. Um, and what ultimately happened about 5,000 years ago was this. The desert got so big um, that the only piece of water, the only place that people could survive, was along the Nile Valley. And you can see it um, from space, thank you, NASA. Um, you've got this river snaking through the desert, the longest river in the world. And all these people were forced to converge on this one valley. And as a result, they had to stop chasing after animals, they had to stop stealing each other's cows and stealing each other's wives, and they had to sit down, take up farming, and get along. As a result, ideas would spread, a bit like Chicago Ideas Week. All these people would form communities, the first villages, the first towns, and ultimately, the first civilization, ancient Egypt, was created as a result of natural climate change, as a result of people being forced to get along. But to really understand this and to get to the point of my story, which is why do we explore, we need to go back even further. We need to go back 70,000 years ago to when Africa was one big jungle. There was no desert. So you had all these cavemen running around, and actually there was a, there was a huge volcanic eruption on the island of Java in Indonesia, which plummeted the earth into utter crisis, the, the biggest ice age we've had, um, and it wiped out 95% of the human beings in the world. So much so that there was only 10,000 humans left on the planet. Imagine that, it was like Armageddon. 10,000 people, all the small pockets of humans that had left Africa hundreds of thousands of years ago, wiped out. All that was left was a very small number of humans scattered around Africa, 
living in the bush. So why then? It begs the question, why did they go on to repopulate the world? Why did they push out in a very short space of time, in just a few thousand years, why did they repopulate the world? It wasn't because there was any lack of resources. It wasn't because the water was running out. It was all there. So there must have been something else. What made the early explorers, those first humans, want to go and stand on tops of hills and see what's over the next horizon? Follow the river, see where it leads. Trek down waterfalls and cross lakes and rivers. What do you think led them to do that? Anyone have any idea what all of these people might have in common, apart from the fact they're all famous and probably drank rosé wine in Paris? Yeah. <laughs> um, there's actually a gene mutation in the, in the human biology, and it's called the gene drd 4 7R, and I'm going to read the description here. It affects 20% of human beings. It's a mutation of the gene that controls dopamine release to the brain. And studies have shown that people who have this mutation are more prone to take risks, experiment with new ideas, food, relationships, embrace movement, to desire change, to pursue short-term rewards, to actively avoid monotony, to respond to novelty, not surprisingly, it's quite closely related to ADHD. And it's also known as the explorer's gene. And it's also found to be highly prevalent amongst nomadic groups, as well as athletes, pilots, photographers, and astronauts. And also, I would suspect, quite a few of the people in this room today. Two people that definitely had the gene mutation here, perhaps two of the most famous people in African exploration, um, Dr. David Livingston, and Henry Morton Stanley, both who went off in the 19th century in search of the Nile, the source of the Nile. And these were my own inspiration, the great Victorian explorers, people who went away for years and years out into the African wilderness to go and search for the source of the river that nobody knew where it was. Um, and so when I was younger, I, I wanted to not only follow in the footsteps of these, my heroes, but also try to follow in the footsteps of the first explorers, those early humans that I've already talked about. So how do you become an explorer? Big question. Um, well, it's not exactly something you can go and speak to your careers advisor about at school, but I did try, aged 10 years old, and he'd said, don't be stupid, go and work in a bank, there's lots more money to be made. Um, <laughs> but I, I stuck with it um, and read a few books and actually figured out that most of my own heroes had gone on to be in the military, so I did that. I went and joined the British Army um, and went out to Afghanistan and all around the world. Um, and then when I left the army, I set up my own expedition organization called Secret Compass, which is basically as a guide taking people out to some of the mo most remote parts of the world, places like Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, um, Central America, all over Asia. Um, and basically all of this was preparation because there was something I wanted to do. I needed to scratch an itch. I needed to do the biggest expedition of my own life and to really push myself to the limits physically and mentally. So I decided to try and walk the entire length of the River Nile. So what is exploration in the 21st century? In an age of Google Earth and all of these sorts of things, surely everywhere's been mapped. Well, it's much more than that. It's about, first and foremost, documentation. Whether you're a scientist coming back with scientific data, a geographer who's mapping new areas, or simply just making a film uh, that documents uh, current affairs and current um, culture. It's about documentation. I was very lucky to get um, TV on board. Um, you can watch the film in the new year on Animal Planet, Discovery Channel. Um, it's also about inspiration and inspiring the next generation of travelers and explorers to go out and pursue their own dreams. Um, this is me about a month ago as I reached the Mediterranean Sea at Alexandria. Um, what you can't see is the reality of an expedition. Just out of shot there, you've got um, several hundred very bewildered Egyptian sunbathers and also uh, a lifeguard that was running after me with a whistle saying I was outside of the safe swimming area. <laughs> And also it's about education, it's about educating yourself, finding out about new cultures and taking those experiences and sharing them with those that are less fortunate. People that can't go and walk down rivers or perhaps the 80% of the world's population that doesn't have the gene mutation. Even if it does mean getting tombstoned by a seven foot Mandari warrior. <laughs> but of course, with, um, with things like this, there's always an element of risk. Um, and I found out firsthand just how dangerous African 
can be. Um, unfortunately, I, I lost a colleague, a journalist who was out there, um, an incredible guy called Matt Power. He succumbed to heat injury on the, on the expedition. Um, but there's lots of, lots of dangers out there, um, not least of which monotony. I walked for nine months. This road alone, it was completely straight for 250 miles through Sudan. Um, it was about 120 degrees and not many people to say hello to, um, apart from this chap who was my guide for that section. Um, no, no talk about a long walk would be complete, of course, with a picture of my feet, so there they are, <laughs> battered and bruised in Egypt somewhere, um, and a completely different shape to what they started out at. <laughs> Um, wildlife. I went through several national parks and some incredibly remote areas. Um, elephants are pretty dangerous, buffaloes. And there's a saying in Africa that the most dangerous place on the continent is between a hippo and the water. And that's where I was for about six months. Um, cr lots of crocodiles, obviously. Needless to say, in nine months I didn't take that many baths. Uh, small deadly snakes and big dead snakes. That was actually about 20 feet long. <laughs> but of course, the most dangerous animal of all is our fellow explorers, it's fellow human beings. Um, one of the things I'm really passionate about is conservation and um, raising money for um, one of my charities, the Tusk Trust. Basically, wildlife is incredibly endangered in Africa. Um, I saw lots of these things, these snares that, um, and these traps that are putting, being put out by poachers on a daily basis. Um, in Africa, wild uh, elephants will be extinct in the wild unless poaching is stopped within 10 years. 10 years, if, uh, if it's not stopped. So this really needs to be, um, more people need to be aware of this. And it's not just people killing wildlife, it's people killing each other. Um, Landmines, I went through South Sudan, it's one of the most heavily landmined countries in the world. Um, and going through a country where all of the maps of where these mines have been put have been lost, it can be an incredibly dangerous thing to be walking through the bush. Um, so you need to really watch your footing. And this is a place called Boar Town. Um, literally two months before I arrived, the town got leveled by rebels and we got shot at when we, when we arrived. Um, 60 people were actually killed the day I arrived there, so I was forced to abort part of the journey and skip over the front line until I got onto the other side. Um, so Africa can be an incredibly dangerous place. It's always in the news for lots of reasons, you know, poverty, war, corruption, tribalism. Um, but what I wanted to try and discover is that the real Africa? And what I discovered was actually, it's not. 90% of Africa is an incredible place, full of incredibly hospitable, welcoming people. And it's a place where there's great hope, hope for peace and reconciliation. The reason I'm showing you this slide, this is in Rwanda, it's called the Nyabarongo Dam. Um, one, it's a place of great change. They're actually diverting um, one of the biggest tributaries of the River Nile to go straight through a mountain to provide a hydroelectric dam uh, to provide electricity for millions and millions of people. Um, it's a continent in flux and developing very, very quickly, more than we realize. Um, it's also indicative of the fact that Rwanda, 20 years ago, in 1994, there was one of the biggest genocides in the world. Over a million people were killed by their neighbours. And now, people are over it. People are getting on with their lives, and people, it's in the past. So, even the biggest problems can be dealt with. But for me, I have to say there was plenty of personal reasons I wanted to do it, if for no other reason than to wake up after an African sunset under the most beautiful sky imaginable. Or wake up in the morning, in the middle of the Sahara Desert with unknown ruins. And who knew, there are more pyramids in Sudan than there are in Egypt. But ultimately, an expedition for me isn't just about putting one foot in front of another. It's not about breaking world records or about um, being to do, doing a world first. It's about the people you meet. Um, and I found that the explorer's gene is a global phenomenon. Everywhere I went on the Nile, people wanted to come with me, even if it was just a few hours, a few days. This guy, Awad from Sudan, he came with, with me for 46 days with his camel. Um, and we actually crossed the entire Sudanese Sahara Desert together. Um, when, we got, when we emerged at the other end into this small village, the first thing we came across was actually an ice cream cellar. He'd got a fridge strapped to the back of his motorbike. So I bought, I bought Awad an ice cream and gave it to him. Um, he sort of sniffed it, asked me if it was baby food, um, <laughs> and then took one lick and threw it on the ground um, before telling me that he thought his tongue was on fire. Uh, <laughs> He's an explorer himself, but he'd never seen ice in his life. 
Um, and that's what I love about going off exploring. Um, so going back to the question, why? Why do it? Well, I have to say, um, I, I always go back to George Mallory, one of, the, um, one of the most famous mountaineers who, when asked by a journalist from the New York Herald, why do you want to go and climb Everest? He responded with probably the three most famous words in exploration history, because it's there. And even Dr. Katangoli in Uganda, who I met, doesn't have any sort of cure for wanderlust. <laughs> so I'd just like to leave on the note that I would implore everyone to go and do two things. Do it in the next week. Go for a walk. You don't have to go all the way to Africa. Just go for a walk. Spend a few hours walking somewhere. And the other one is go and sit next to somebody in a cafe. You never know where the adventure might lead. Thank you very much.